Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, this is our second town hall meeting of, uh, of this semester and first one this month. Uh, this town hall meeting is about Know Your Rights. Um, this is about uh, the immigration ban and the DACA updates. Um, I am Zahara. Uh, I am the student body president here at Richmond College. And we are here to keep the students informed with facts and not just uh, uh, like you know, make them concerned with all the false rumors and the false facts that's been going around. And we're also here today to ease any concerns the student might have regarding the um, recent events that has been happening around the nation. Uh, Dr. K. Eggleston, the president of Freshman College, could not be here today, but she does send uh, her uh, thoughts. I'm going to read out her email that she sent me. Um, during these uncertain times of the national debate surrounding DACA, I want to assure our Richmond College undocumented students that they are welcome to pursue and achieve their higher education dreams in the Dallas County Community College District, and especially here at Richland. As a reminder, 10 years ago, DACA, the state of Texas, passed a law, HB 1403, or the Noriega Bill, which provides in-state uh, tuition to certain non-immigrant and undocumented students who met the following guidelines. Resided in Texas with a parent or guardian, guardian I'm sorry, while attending high school in Texas, uh, graduated from a public or private high school or received a GED in Texas, resided in Texas for the three, for the three years leading to graduation or receipt of a GED, and provided their institution a, a signed affidavit indicating an intent to apply for permanent resident status as soon as able to do so. The Noriega Bill's sole per focus was to provide a path for undocumented students to affordable higher education. It is not an immigration law. Our undocumented students are not alone. DCCCD stands with you, your faculty, and I stand with you, Dr. K. Eccleston, Richland College President. And with that, I want to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have Zainab Munawar. She is the Human Rights President here at Richland College. Um, we have Tracy Smith, she's an attorney from Buer and Lormand. We have Edurne, uh, she is the vice consulate of the Mexican consulate, I'm sorry. And then we have Gil Zafra, he is here from uh, Buer and Lormand. And we also have with us Roberto Alonso, the Texas State Representative. And I give the floor over to Mr. Gil to take over. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Sahara. Thank you. Uh, well, welcome all. This, the, the objective of, of this panel is to really know more about our rights besides being scared and panic about all what media has been causing about the new uh, um, immigration timing that we are uh, living with, with this new administration. So we're going to start by uh, trying to understand what the SB4 law is about and what the status of the SB4 is right now. So um, Mr. Roberto Alonso, can you share with us what is the SB4 law, please? Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak at uh, Richland College. I'm a state rep out of uh, Oak Cliff, Grand Prairie, Texas. Uh, I sit on the... Um, calendars committee, pensions, and higher education. So I get very involved in higher education issues. And as was pointed out, this 1403 law was passed in 2001, 16 years ago, by uh, Noriega, state rep out of Houston. That said that if you're an undocumented uh, student, you can come to college and pay in-state tuition. And every two years, we fight it over and over again. We're going to fight it again this year. And I sit in the committee, so it stopped there. And uh, in the Senate side, they still talked about it because they wanted to get rid of it, so we stopped it. In the House side, we're very uh, um, understanding and know the importance of this law, so we're going to fight, you know, you know, to keep it. Uh, that being said, so this past spring, we uh, de debated SB4. In a nutshell, I'll tell you what SB4 does. It restricted the speech of elected officials and public employees by forbidding them from criticizing SB4. It authorized individual police officers to cooperate with federal officials in immigration enforcement and provide enforcement assistance, and required local jails to hold an individual on a request from ICE 
also known as detainers, even after that person will otherwise be released, such after the person post bail. That's in a nutshell what it is. So where are we at with SB4? We had a big debate in the, in the floor of the House and in the Senate, it passed the Senate, it passed the House, got signed by the governor. But what I tell people, this is democracy. And democracy doesn't mean when a bill passes, it's over. Under democracy, we have the executive, the judicial, and the representative, uh, House of Representatives. So what was the next step? The next step was to go to court. And right now, right now, right now, the court has stopped it. A guy by the name of Orlando Garcia, a judge out of San Antonio, stopped it. And what he said, and the key thing that he said in his uh, long uh, opinion was, Texas cannot, through state law, expand the limited circumstances in which local officials may perform the functions of immigration. What that means, and we knew all along, in Texas, we have uh, state laws. Texas cannot, you know, do federal laws. Immigration is a federal law. But like has been pointed out, there's all these things about what I call the kukui. You guys know what a kukui is? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you don't know what a kukui is. You can raise your hand. Raise your hand. Anyway, the kukui is the boogeyman. So we created this thing called SB4 because there's a boogeyman out there that, you know, immigration is bad. But like everything, when you were a kid, and I was a kid once, my mom used to say, Roberto, you better go to sleep or the cuckoo is going to get you. So that's what people are doing by creating this SP4, in my opinion. And I say that because we've already won one battle, which was in court. And like you know, it's going to go to the Court of Appeals. It's going to go to the Supreme Court. And what I say is, there's laws. And just you know, take a deep breath, we can handle it. For example, you, the Supreme Court said gays can marry, right? And people thought that was never going to happen. And it's the law. Well, the Supreme Court has also made a lot of decisions about immigration. You might not like it, but it's the law. But hopefully the, the same understanding judges that have ruled against states trying to create federal laws will stop. So that in a nutshell is uh, SB4, but I'm looking forward to commenting about DACA as well. So let, let's put an example, yeah. Mr. Alonso. If a police officer detain us, and I infer any police officer from, from the state, from the city, from a college, or from community college or from a university can stop us. If we have incurred in a sea level crime, right? So what will happen if we are in that situation? Well, let me tell you what I think and what I know. Let me tell you what that means, okay? Right now, with says before or without as before, we have rights. Let me tell you what that means. I do criminal defense. You guys ever heard the concept, you have a right to remain silent, anything will be used against you. It applies also to immigration. If an immigration officer stops you, or a police officer, with as before or without as before, they stop you, the only thing you have to do is give your name, your birthday, and that's it. That's it. They can ask you questions like, do you have papers, do you have insurance, do you have a license, did you kill a police officer? All you gotta say, there's four ways to answer a police officer and answer to your question. You can say yes, you can say no, you can be quiet, right? Because that's what the law says, you have a right to remain silent. It is, but it's not. Let me tell you what I mean by that. You guys have heard the phrase in Spanish, for those of you that are translated, el que calla otorga. He would stay silent, says yes. Like, where were, were you at this place and you stay silent, you mean yes, right? Were you with this girl? You stay silent, that means yes, right? Anyway, under the law, it also means yes. Do you have paper, you stay silent, say yes, and if it's not true, then they can you know, put other charges against you for lying. The best thing to do is the fourth answer. If you have any questions, please talk to my lawyer. And you go, well, what lawyer? I mean, how are they gonna know? All you gotta do is say, talk to my lawyer. It's like a big shield. So in answer to your question, right now, right now, with or without SB4. That's what the law is. Now, in reality, you know what's going to happen. Some of these cops are going to get upset. Well, why aren't you asking? Are you trying to hide something? I'll give you an example. I got a client right now, and I just talked to the police officer. He's accused of a felony. I go, bring him over. I want to talk to him. I go, you know I can't let you talk to him. Because the first thing you're going to tell him, if you talk to me, anything you say will be used against me. Same thing as applies from my perspective. 
And I think that's part of what we have to do on these forums, make sure people understand and know their rights. Thank you. Attorney, Attorney Tracy, what do you think about this before law? Um, well, I think there's some, there's clearly some uncertainties as to what's going to happen. Um, but I, I don't, I, I agree with um, Mr. Alonzo that um, you have to be careful when you're dealing with authorities with or without SB4. Um, the one thing I would add to what he says is there's some risk uh, no matter what you do when you're um, dealing with law enforcement. So if you say um, get pulled over for a broken tail light or some minor traffic offense and they just want to write you a ticket and they don't care if you're legal or illegal, undocumented, um, they just want some form of identification to know who you are so they can write your ticket. Some officers, that's all they want. They don't care. They're not going to provide your information to ICE, but you don't know. You don't know which officers are which. Others, they want to know your status, and if you provide them with a foreign identification, that gives them the, the clues they need about uh, your legal status or lack thereof. Uh, so it's, there's no good answer when you're dealing with um, law enforcement uh, other than <laughs> be careful. Um, uh, you don't want to be stopped by law enforcement. They cannot stop you only to ask you about your legal status. Uh, but as far as how to deal with them, if you are stopped, um, that's kind of, um, th there's risks there either way. However you deal with them, tell them to talk to my lawyer. Um, tell them you don't have an ID, provide an ID, whatever you decide, there are its own unique risks. So just understanding those is the first step for you deciding how you act if you are confronted with a, a situation with law enforcement. Thank you. I'd like to move forward to, to the topic of know your rights, and I'll let you to visualize what would happen if a nice agent detain us and we are in a, in a detention center in ICE. What our rights are? How should we try to keep ourselves ourselves in, in, in the U.S. in the country? Uh, well, to echo what uh, Mr. Alonzo was saying is, um, remember that you have the right to remain silent. So um, you don't have to answer their questions. Um, ask to um, speak to your attorney, and above all, do not sign anything until you speak to an attorney. Um, a lot of the times. Uh, ICE will try to get you to sign a voluntary departure. And um, basically what that is is a statement saying <laughs> you're going to voluntarily leave the country. Um, so you're giving up your right to fight to stay in this country if you sign something like that. Um, or at least it makes it a lot harder. So don't sign anything until you talk to an attorney if you are detained by ICE. So it would be a good practice or good advice if we all keep and. Uh, the phone number of our immigration attorney, right? Our cell phones? Absolutely. Okay. Can I say something? Yeah, please. Let, let me add to what, what uh, Ms. Smith said, is this. And, and that's what the press is saying. Do not sign anything. But let me tell you this, from what I know, because what I do is do the criminal law, and then my guys go to immigration, so if they get out or they don't go, I still ask them what happens, so I'm able to tell you the story because that's how you find out what's going on. What I have heard is when they get there, they heard not to sign anything. And on occasion, immigration has offered them a bond. And they don't want to sign the bond because they've been told not to sign. So the deal is, like Ms. Uh, Smith said, read what you're, you know, make sure it's not a voluntary departure. Now, I just finished talking to an ICE agent, uh, uh, Agent Evans. I go, what's going on? I mean, I had a guy who had a, uh, what's called paraphernalia. He had a big drug case, so I dropped it down to a Class C ticket. They still didn't give him a bond. So something's going on, you know, as was pointed out. There's what the law is, what you can't do, and what's going on. But one of the things is, as we talk about knowing your rights, mm -hmm. look at what they're showing you. What is the paper? The other thing is about, you know, talk to my attorney, is because you wanna, you're not gonna know some of the questions they're gonna ask you. For example, I tell my clients when you talk to an immigration agent, they start asking about the drug case, about the DWI, about the domestic violence. Every single person is not guilty until proven guilty. 
But if you start answering questions, you know, did you raise your hand, did you touch her? I mean, all those things can be used against you. So again, it follows through with, similarly, like you have a right to remain silent, is please talk to my attorney. And I encourage strongly, strongly, like not wait. If you have issues, not wait. Right now, right now, talk to somebody so you can know, so you can feel more comfortable when you hear this concept about talk to all my attorney. As you pointed out, have the cell phone, have the number. I mean, you don't even have to give them the name. All you gotta do is tell them to talk to my attorney, but if you feel more comfortable, okay, here's a phone number, call them. And what is the attorney gonna say? Was well, this guy this or that? They can't. All they can say is, look, if you have any questions, ask me. But are you gonna come over? Anyway, it better is right now, we to feel more comfortable, to get more comfort and assurance, I encourage you uh, equally, talk to somebody right now. Thank you. Vice Consul Adern, you represent the Mexican Consulate, and we know that Mexican Consulate, Consulate has been really very, very active and proactive with the community, especially the Mexican community, but also the developing all the other strategic alliances with other consulates in North Texas. Can you tell us about what the Mexican Consulate is doing right now to educate Mexicans or all these other alliances uh, that you have nailed, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with Representative Alonso and Attorney Smith. It is so important for all of you, well, for the people who have uh, an immigration status that it's irregular in some way to, to get informed uh, ahead of uh, getting into trouble. I mean, it, it is always harder to try to fix the, or find the, the solution or the best way out when you are in the problem already. So it is always um, super uh, important, very important for, uh, to, to get prepared and to get informed ahead of time, uh, to get in touch with an immigration attorney. Uh, in these brochures that have been distributed to you, they uh, make a warning in regards to notary publics. It is very important that you realize that notary publics are not attorneys who can actually advise you. So it's important for you to get in touch with an immigration attorney. And that's one of the things we do at the consulate. Uh, as you know, the Mexican community is very large in, in North Texas. Uh, the Consulate General of Mexico in Dallas is one of 11 consulates that the government of Mexico has in Texas. We actually have a network of 50 consulates in the US. And we all do have a very big documentation department and protection department. So we have these two uh, basic departments. In the protection department, we have um, open sessions every day with uh, people working for the consulate who know uh, about different types of law, labor, immigration, criminal, uh, family matters, etc. So Mexican nationals can walk in and get um, information and advice every day. And if the situation is a little bit more complicated, we can always um, send them to uh, one of the firms that we have alliances with. And even the government of Mexico can pay for some of these fees. We actually do have a special program right now to help uh, Mexican nationals who, are, um, who can benefit with uh, this period of time that, ha that it has opened to renew your DACA working permit. So if it expires uh, the latest on March 5th, you have until October 5th to renew your permit. So the Mexican uh, government is uh, giving some support, economic support to, to people who, to these dreamers who can uh, benefit from this window of time and they can also do that at the consulates. And we have a very active program to give documentation to our nationals, uh, not only at our base here in Dallas, but we have mobile consulates traveling around North Texas all year long in order to um, get to know their birth certificates, the identifications they have, so we can issue a consular ID card or a passport, and they can always have an identification with them. Um, going to Attorney Smith point, what we have seen is that uh, when they don't have anything else, to have a consular ID card can help, help them um, in, in different situations when they encounter law enforcement agencies, uh, agents, sorry, if they 
ask for an ID and they are actually able to provide an, a, a valid ID. Uh, sometimes the law enforcement agents are just, you know, uh, happy and they let them go. So it's important for every, every person, every Mexican national, and this advice, of course, goes to everybody to always have an identification on them. So those are two of the main programs we have. Um, it's it's uh, going to, to your question. Thank you, Gil. Thank you. So it seems that the Mexican consulate has been really very driving on how to make an action plan in case we are deported, right? So Attorney Smith, what should we do? What, what should we, what would you recommend us as an action plan if we feel we, we can have that possibility of being, of being deported? Uh, I'd say the first step is, this is self-serving since I'm an attorney, but um, talk to an immigration attorney. Um, there are a lot of visas that people don't even know about, uh, so you don't know what you might qualify for that you don't even know about. Um, you may be assuming that you're deportable when you uh, may be eligible for some, uh, some visa. Uh, so the first step is to talk to an immigration attorney. Um, after that, if, if an attorney determines that you're not eligible for any kind of visa um, or any kind of status, then um, I would say after that it's important to get your affairs in order, obviously, and have a plan if you think you um, are at risk of, of being deported. Um, there are things that um, we do at my firm, such as powers of attorney, that basically um, give someone else the power to uh, wrap up your affairs in case you're suddenly deported and can't do it yourself. Um, the only other advice I think I can give is um, just try to tr stay out of trouble. Um, if you are deportable, you are probably not at the top of ICE's list to actually deport unless you have a criminal record. Um, those, what we see is those tend to go to the top of their priority list. So if you have a clean record, you're doing yourself a favor. Can I say something? Yeah, yeah. yeah just I wanted to mention that we totally agree with uh, Tony Smith's point. What we have seen at the consulate is that most of the people who get into a deportation situation is because they had some kind of criminal record. And many people get in trouble while driving because they drive under the influence or uh, we even advise our nationals to try to drive a car, not a luxurious car, of course, but a car in good condition. Because um, even though it is not written on the law, a car in bad condition will call the attention probably more, more the attention from the law enforcement agent than a, than a car that is in good condition. So just try to, to drive safely, follow all the rules, uh, if you know you're driving with, without a driver's license. And of course, do not drive on, under the influence. And this sounds a little bit obvious, but many people get in trouble because of that. So uh, just think about the consequences and the problems that could uh, come into your life if you drive under, uh, under the influence. No? So. so just to clarify, eyes do not deport us in a, a random way. I mean, they're not putting uh, checkpoints on the streets to no. say, hey, I'm gonna deport that person or that person. They have an agenda. I mean, they have a, they, they have a, a case of deportation, basically. Is that, is that right? Is that accurate? Or sometimes they just wake up in a bad Monday and they decide to go for people. I would say generally there's a plan. Um, it's not unheard of to do uh, random raids uh, or what we perceive as random. Um, but again, even if uh, you're detained by ICE um, and you um, have a, a, a case in court, um, your case in court is probably not going to be uh, a high priority without that criminal record. And if they knock the door of your, or your apartment or your home, what should you do? Uh, I, I would suggest not answering the door if um, you do not have legal status. Um, if they have a signed order by a judge to enter, and you can allow them to enter. Um, but uh, uh, generally speaking, you don't have to open the door otherwise. Uh, if they become forceful, uh, just be respectful and cooperate. Uh, you don't want to add resisting or anything like that uh, to, to any problems. So um, if they force the issue, um, just, um, like I said, be respectful and cooperative. And then you can later request to speak to your attorney. Thank you. Well, let's move forward to talk about DACA. Yeah. Mr. Roberto Lanzo, what's next with DACA? Oh, okay, so 
Uh, plan A is what DACA is or is not today. You got to turn in certain papers by October 5th. They, they've extended it for six months. You know, if you fulfill all those requirements, that's what it is. But the way I like to look at it is what is and what will be. And what will be is what we make it. So the next step, in my opinion, so plan A is what is right now, and plan B, which is the bigger plan, is what the president has said. I'll give you six months to fix the problem, which is a way is good. He could have just said it's over, cut it off, and you're on your own. And, and it would have been even more crazy. So let's now say it's just a little bit crazy even though it's crazy. So what is what we gotta do? What we have to do is not the DACA people, it's us. Us that are citizen voters, registered to vote, that have our congressmen. Each one of us that are citizens has at least one congressman and two U.S. senators that we can talk to. In Texas, for example, I have uh, Eddie Bernice Johnson and Ted Cruz and John Cornyn. And you say, well, they're the bad guys of the world. Well, there's good guys and bad guys. What we want is to talk and have a conversation, and this is the conversation. The conversation is DACA kids got, were given an opportunity in 2012 to get a work permit, a social security number, and a driver's license. And they were told, behave or we take it away from you. And there are examples where they didn't behave. But overwhelmingly, there's a lot of examples where they did good. And what the numbers show, just in Texas, $6 billion in economic contribution. That's going to go away. But even more than that, what they contribute, some of them are teachers, doctors, lawyers. There's a lot of positive contribution. And you will hear that another part of the plan is a lawsuit. For example, Javier Becerra, California, amongst others, are saying, you guys gave these guys a benefit. The, the universities you know, hired people to teach these kids, there's jobs, there's, you know, we're relying, and now you're taking it away. So we're suing you to keep it so you cannot take away those benefits. But even more than that, I think the next step is what? We need 217 congressmen on the House. We need approximately 60 senators in the Senate to make sure it happens. And then we need the president. So as far as the president, uh, you know how he is. You know, he, one day he's happy, the next day, which is good. I mean, I like it for him to be shifting because if he didn't shift, if he just said no, now that would be a problem. For example, you get Pence, in my opinion, he's gonna say no and stay no, as opposed to Trump. He said he's willing you know, to shift back and forth. So that's one step. On the other ones, I was going through uh, the internet today before coming here, and uh, there was an article that was written about September 5th where uh, 26 Republicans, 26, had uh, indicated supporting Dream Act at some point or another. So you got 200 uh, Democrats and you get 26 and we need 17, so we're within the range of discussion. The other one is in the Senate, you know, we got 48 uh, Democrats and then there's Collins and the list, you know, Lindsey Graham, John McCain, so the list starts going up. So the next, I think the next step in my opinion is to work real hard in a very uh, good way to discuss with these individuals the benefits of DACA, the benefits of individuals, the benefits of the economy, the benefits of what's uh, quality of life, the benefits of how contributions are made to this government, and, and keep it on the positive tone. Keep it on the positive tone how, you know, we have a lot, we have, we have great, you know, uh, individuals that have done well, Let's you know, t put them in front of them, uh, the arguments, uh, and so I think that's what's next. And I think it's workable and, it, and it's doable that we can do it. Th there are kids, um, they meant well, they came here without you know, uh, knowing, uh, they were brought without their permission, they're here, and we've already done a lot here in the United States to uh, make that argument. Let me give you a quick answer on that. Prior to 1981, in Texas, I'm a legislator. In Texas, the legislature said, there's no money in, for the school, so why don't we kick out the kids without documents so that way we don't have to pay for them? And they did. They kicked out the kids, you know, 18 and under from the schools, and there was a lawsuit, Fighter versus Doe, there was one through uh, Tyler, Texas, went all the way to Supreme Court that said, these kids, it's not their fault, same argument, that they were brought here. We're gonna teach these kids, we're gonna educate them, and they have as much right as anybody else. So we already have a history 
in Texas are making it happen, and I, I feel very positive we're going to make this happen as well. So, um, may I add something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, regarding how uh, Mr. Roberto said that you can contact your re local rep representatives, um, for those of you who want to contact your re local representatives but don't know what to say, um, the website Indivisible Guide has state-specific scripts where you can, and it uh, has the contact information for your local representatives where you can use these scripts to uh, email or call in your uh, representative's office and they have uh, scripts related to DACA, criminaliz criminalization of immigrants um, against mass deportation and supporting sanctuary cities. So for those of you who do want to contact but don't know what to say, there are resources available online that tell you exactly what to say so you don't have to, you know, fumble your way through that and you know specifically what points to hit. Yeah. Sainab, could you please share with us what are you doing right now to help that as a community at, at the Richland College uh, to be very informed, to, to, I don't know, get some possibilities for them. What, what are you doing? What, what's your plan right now for them? Um, well, right now we're going to uh, work with the uh, Latino club on campus and probably have a silent march around campus. We're working on to get that figured out so we can have just, you know, aware, spread, first of all, spread awareness of what is going on and the lives that will be affected by this. But also, um, not, I don't only want to educate people because, yes, that's important, but also we need to make a daily change. And so um, one is, first of all, education, at learning about what DACA is and how it helps students on campus and just in our communities in general. Um, I also want to uh, work in, with donations with um, people who are trying to renew their DACA status. Uh, the renewal costs, I believe, $495, and it's not something that can easily um, make made up. So you know, I'm working on uh, finding different organizations who are uh, working to raise that money to help um, people trying to renew their status. Um, I also want to have a workshop where people can come in and learn about, you know, how to uh, contact career representatives and, you know, how it's not as hard as it seems. And people think that making a difference with stuff like this is super hard and that, you know, you have to put a lot of effort into it, but it's as easy as writing out an email or making a call. And even that small act can make such a difference. Um, you know, it's, and I just want to work towards helping people understand that, you know, these issues are so important and they will impact us on a daily basis if we don't work towards, you know, making a difference. Mm -hmm. So we basically have two possible outcomes, no? The first one is a deadlock between the legislative and executive, right? And the second one is that the program is over. Now, if the program is over, how can we be creative for that cast? Because right now many of them have a legal status. Are they able, for example, to get, I don't know, a petition if they, if they get married? If they start up a new business, can they get a possible an, an investor's visa? Or, I don't know, things like that, um, Attorney Smith. Do you think they have some possibilities while they have a legal status through DACA? Uh, absolutely, and, and that's kind of what I was talking about before, is you may not even know what you qualify for. So. Uh, even if your DACA is expiring and you're not eligible to renew, or if you don't get your renewal in by October 5th, um, still talk to an attorney because um, there are lots of ways uh, to, to get legal status um, uh, through spouse, through investing, um, having employers sponsor you. Um, if you've been a victim of domestic violence or um, if you were a victim of a violent or serious crime, there are different types of visas for a lot of different scenarios that you may not even know about. Um, I think the materials in your chair there, um, the um, AILA, the um, American Immigration Lawyers Association, estimates that 30%, I think, of um, people who came in for uh, DACA questions actually uh, were eligible for um, another kind of status. Well, so. you, have, you have a comment? Yes. I, I want to add the, the, the part of um, contacting your state rep and how uh, it does impact. Let me tell you, you might think people don't listen, but they do listen. Uh, I'm talking about the congressman and the senator. They count how many times they get a text or an email or a phone call or a letter or a visit. Why? Because we know that we get elected by the voters and the voters decide what are the issues for them. 
The other part, is does, it, does your effort count? The answer is yes. And let me give you an example of that as it relates to Richland College. In 2003, I met with all the, the, the deans and professors, I think, in the liberal arts department. And this college said, we want to set up a center for Mexican-American studies here in Richland College. And I think there's one, right? Anyway, in 2003, they came to me, and we went through the process, and I worked with a Republican uh, state representative here from this area, from Richardson, Texas. So we worked through the process, and right now, since 2003, as it, relate, as it relates to that effort that this, you know, this college asked me to do, uh, we have a state law that says every junior college must have a center for Mexican-American studies. I say that as it relates to what's being talked about, contacting your representatives. Folks, it does work. I know there's a lot of, you know, uh, information, publicity, a lot of negativity and positive reaction to this particular issue. It is what it is. The deal is not that it is what it is. There's positive and negative, depending on, on, on what perspective you look at it. We want to get it done. We cannot stand back or, you know, not do anything. We got to make our case. There are people listening. Uh, we need a certain number to get it over the top, and that's who we have to concentrate on. You're not going to change somebody's mind that has already decided, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. Okay, we understand. But let's talk to people that are willing to, be, to consider it. Let's make the argument, and I think we can get it done. I, I see that, you know, even though it's, it's, you know, we're going through a lot of heartache, a lot of heartbreak right now, I think we, we need to keep it going so we can get that opportunity and, and let this not, because let me tell you what it is, folks. This is not going to be a suspension of deportation that we're fighting for. We're fighting for permanent residency, which is a bigger, bigger deal. So they took one away, which was, you know, a suspension. Now they're offering an opportunity to get permanent residency. Plus, you know, let's go, let's score, let's get it done. I think there's a good opportunity. You so, mean the Dream Act? No, no. The, right now, the, the discussion in Austin, I mean, in Washington, is not just a suspension of deportation, it's residency. Yes. So rather than hearing the cucuyo, cucuy. the cucuy, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> el coco, el coco, el cucuy, thing, yeah, it's the same. The boogeyman. And be panicked by the cucuy, mm -hmm. so we should be focused and respecting the law. Mm -hmm. Yes. And otherwise, we're we're, not, we're, gonna, we're going to lose productivity. We're going to get lower uh, scores in, at school, et cetera, right? And use our common sense. I mean, get yourself out of trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, we would like to open uh, the forum for uh, the a Q&A. We want to interact with you. We want to hear and listen to your, your concerns, your questions. And, um, and our panelists are going to be more than like to, to answer your questions. So please, don't be, sh don't be shy. Yeah. yeah. The question I have is, um, okay. um, the question I have is, I know all of you would keep up with the news that's happening now. Um, I'm very sure all of you heard, the, um, heard about the first pardon the president had on an image for, since the beginning of his term was, um, Sheriff, I mean, at least formal sheriff, Arpario. And Arpario, if you know his history, he deliberately stopped people on the road just because they were either Latino or, or black. Just stopped them because he just saw their color of skin and decided, okay, this is an immigrant, and arrested him and put him in jail for months with no, and with no reason after. And for the president to support this kind of um, this kind of attitude, to release him from jail, and tell everyone that he was arrested for doing his job, doesn't this doesn't this point us in the direction that either the president knows what he did and just and supports it all the way, or he just doesn't know what he's doing? So, are we supposed to be are we looking at? Um, in America where this is going to be happening is, what are we supposed to do about this? What are we supposed to um, do about if the whole president that's representing the whole nation is saying this is all right, this is what's supposed to be happening? 
somebody, I'll Nothing comment. Yeah, to represent this <laughs> alone. That's a great question. <laughs> well, great I'll question. comment. My comment is this. I didn't like it. I hated it. I think it was disgusting. It's bad. It's awful. Okay? It's bad. In the history, back in 1975 or so, 74, 74, President Ford pardoned President Nixon. I didn't like it either. I didn't like it either. There's been parts that are very, very bad, and it is bad. You know, what this guy did to our community in Arizona is horrible. It's bad. So we stay there, we object, we express our feelings, now we go to what's going on. We're talking about getting legislation passed. In the last seven days, the Democrats and Trump came to an agreement to give Texas and the Harvey victims, the hurricane, $15 billion. Several Republicans from, the United, from Texas said no. So the deal is there will be things that we don't like in Austin. There are things that I hate. I hated this before. I voted against it. I voted against so many issues, but I also voted for positive things. $400 million for scholarships to college kids. $5 million through, since 2003 for bilingual education scholars. $7.5 billion for TRS pensions, teachers' pensions. $7.5 billion for uh, state employees' pension. $2 million for a task force here in North Texas, was called Task Force 2, that went to Rockport. I don't like everything, but I gotta look at it in perspective. If I didn't like, for example, that and left and walked away, now we gotta work on another issue, which is this issue. Yes, we never forget on things that happen. We don't agree. We can feel bad. We can talk about it on that issue. Now let's talk about DACA. Let's talk about DACA. Can we come to an agreement on that? Because if we walk away, we're still going to need the president, we're going to need the Senate, and we're going to need the House. So what, and that's why I stay as a representative for 19 years, because I know by being there, you can put your two cents worth and try to get things done or try to stop things from happening. For example, this last session, they wanted to pass a law that says Planned Parenthood could not provide health services you know, uh, uh, health care services at the local level, and we were able to stop it. They, they passed it at the state, but we were stop it, able to stop it at the local level. By being there, you cannot walk away, you gotta get engaged, and, and there's two things. There's election time. We're not in election time, folks, right now. There's no election, so you gotta work with what you got. When the elections comes up, then you have another opportunity, but right now, we gotta work with what we got. And I see this opportunity over the last seven days because Trump worked with the Democrats to get us the money for Texas and Hurricane Harvey. Yeah, and may I say something? I believe that, we believe that the one of the positive things about DACA, having had DACA all these years, is that now we have numbers that prove how young people under the protection of DACA have developed uh, more positively, I mean, have developed better. So uh, to the point of represent, rep representative alone, so we need, I think it is important to focus on how not having DACA would impact the country, the state, the economy, would impact the society as a whole. Not trying, um, the country not to see DACA as an individual problem of dreamers, but something that really uh, is important for the whole country and for the whole country future now, so. Uh, and there are numbers, very valuable numbers, about how 97% uh, of beneficiaries studies or works, 91% of beneficiaries works, 45% of the beneficiaries study, and among them, 72% are enrolled in a bachelor's or postgraduate program. Uh, furthermore, 69% found a better job thanks to the program, to DACA. More than 90% obtained a driver's license or state ID, 5% started their own business, a percentage greater than the 3.1% uh, 3 of the rest of the population of the country. So you see in the Dreamers group a very uh, uh, positive and powerful, a, a, a very powerful group with a lot of potential at, that could contribute positively to, uh, positively to, the, to the society. So it's important to take that into consideration. All right, how y'all doing? Um, good to see you again, uh, Representative Alonzo. Uh, 
saw you at the AFL-CIO meeting, but I didn't have a chance to speak with you, uh, which was a great meeting. But um, I just wanted to say that uh, uh, I'm, actu I'm actually the uh, chapter president of Turning Point USA here on campus. Uh, we're a student movement, uh, nonprofit, nonpartisan. Um, but I just wanted to get, I don't know who anybody can answer this question, but I was just curious on um, what about uh, out of the eight, and correct me if I'm wrong, about the 800,000 um, DACA members or here in the United States, uh, correct, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but what about the nearly, um, uh, there's been reports that there's been nearly uh, two or 3,000 DACA members uh, that commit crime. I just want to know what y'all think about that or uh, what y'all's two cents, um, the DACA members um, that had committed crime here in this country. I'll, I'll comment and I ask you know, others to comment. People are people. People are given an opportunity. You got 800,000, you know, look at it, it's about close to maybe 1%. It's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. But what we do in society, we look at the overall picture of what benefit has been contributed. We know the numbers, we know what's happened. I mean, I represent kids that are DACA that were charged, and that's part of the deal, they're young. The difference is you're young, you get into bigger trouble. So I don't know what the numbers are, they're probably that, they might be smaller, but what we do is look at the overall picture. And that's why, for example, you have at least 26 congressmen, Republican, that are willing to support or have taught, said at one point or another they're gonna support it, you got McCain, you got Lindsey Graham, and they're being yelled at by the Republican voters. Why are you, you know, supporting people that broke the law? Well, we're gonna have that discussion. Are these individuals criminals? The answer is no. No. A person that is undocumented according to the Supreme Court law says, if you're in this United States, you're not a criminal because you don't have documents. Number two, you're not a criminal because you work without documents. You're a criminal if you break the law, but if you're here in the United States, that doesn't make you a criminal. And I'll give you an example. I did a case where the guy was charged with a felony. He got sentenced to over 30 years. I appealed the case. The, the, the uh, 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 district attorney argued that this, my guy was a double criminal. That one, he pled guilty to the crime, and two, he was here without documents. The Court of Appeals in Dallas said that's not true. This person, and they cited the Supreme Court, is not a criminal because uh, he's in the United States, and he's not a criminal, okay? He's not a criminal criminal, okay? He's a person, he's civilly, it's not legal, but he's not a criminal. So in answer to your question, are there gonna be people? Yes. Are there gonna be people that do bad things? Yes, but you can't you know, blame everybody for what one or, or whatever number it is. We're gonna look at the whole picture and make my, our argument. 5% started their own business, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These individuals on their own are gonna make their case. And then the people, the, the congressmen and the senators, in my opinion, if we can get to them, we're gonna vote yes. And I would add to that, um, you know, I don't know those, those statistics. I don't know if they're correct. I don't know where they came from, but I always question statistics. I'm a little dubious in the first place. Um, one question I would have is, okay, you say two to 3,000, um, is that all types of crime down to a class C misdemeanor? Because most of us in this room would probably be criminals under that standard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so. true. That's true. And yeah, another point is I totally agree with you. <coughs> Statistics, you, you need to go to, to how they were made done and what they are mm -hmm. taking into consideration, what they are anal analyzing. But what we know at, at the council it, is that criminal rates among undocumented migrants are much lower than criminal rates among uh, people from the U.S., I mean, people uh, from, from here. So uh, we would need also to compare those numbers to other groups to see if, com in comparison, DACA dreamers, DACA uh, beneficiaries have uh, behaved better or wor worse. So you would need to have all those statistics and, and know all the numbers to be able to make a comparison and, and, and a real analysis. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's, uh, that is an issue um, because uh, originally um, to participate in the DACA program, these people were told that their information would not be um, provided to ICE or used to deport them. Um, so uh, if, if that becomes an issue uh, after the expiration of DACA and their information is being uh, used against them, I would envision a series of lawsuits from that. Uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, find out what your opinions are about the, the two current lawsuits. Uh, explain some of the uh, bases, some of the things that they're using to uh, argue uh, against uh, the Trump, Trump's decision. And the other question I have is, what do you think if, and let's hope that perhaps uh, the Congress and Senate will uh, be able to pass uh, some type of a dream act, uh, what is the likelihood that uh, President Trump would sign it? Uh, in my opinion, I think um, President Trump doesn't always care about the backlash, clearly. Um, but he's gotten a lot of, of, a lot of uh, criticism on this decision. Um, and in some of his uh, tweets lately, <laughs> he's, he seems to be wavering a little bit about this decision. Uh, I think one of his tweets even said he hopes that Congress passes legislation to legalize DACA. Um, so, uh, I mean, it would depend on um, the, what they try to pass, I think, but I think uh, with the amount of pressure he's facing, uh, I don't think it's unlikely that he would sign it. Um, that's just my personal opinion. Um, I think he'll sign it, uh, and I used the, what's happened the last seven days, and I saw an article on CNN, you know, why did the president, you know, side with the Democrats? And the CNN article says he hates Paul Ryan, hates McConnell, number one. Number two, it's common sense, you know. I mean, that's what it said, you know. You know, because remember what is being said, there's a lot of backlash. He don't care. I mean, he, he tweets one thing one day, tweets another. I mean, I don't even tweet, but that's another story. <laughs> but, but, then, but we got to, you know, we got this opportunity. I mean, no, we, we are where we are, so we got to take that. Now, in answer to your question about what the basis of the lawsuits are, from what I've read, and I haven't read all the lawsuits, but I, I try to keep up as much as possible. Uh, Neil Politano from uh, uh, California says, when you gave these kids an opportunity, you gave them a job, you gave them work, you know, we started hiring people, professors, you know, they're hiring, you know, workers, and the list goes on. And so you've created an infrastructure that if you get rid of the kids, you're going to lose, you know, all that effort. And in a way, you've given something that you shouldn't be taking back. Whether we're going to win or not, that's another story. That's why, you know, as uh, President Obama said when he was working and trying to get legislation passed, do you want an executive order or you want residency? And folks says, we want residency. Well, there's pluses and minus to that, and you're seeing it now. Now we're here today. There's an opportunity for residency. You know, we fight like hell to make it happen. We make our arguments, we make our numbers, we make our case, we make our contributions and make it happen. So that's the House and the Senate, and as you pointed out again with uh, President Trump, uh, one of the comments I saw was that he should keep his word. He's a man, and that's how you guys get up to us. Men, you know, you keep your word. He's not keeping his word. But hey, are we gonna take it? Yes, we want him to keep our word, not the other word. Whichever word, but as long as he signs it, that but we got to make our case. He's given us an opportunity. I know there was a lot of debate within his administration for and against. Uh, so I think he came out in the middle, extending it for six months or whatever. So let's let's work on it, uh, make our argument, give our numbers, and you know I'm I'm hopeful. I and that's why I stay in the legislature because it creates an opportunity to have that conversation. The other thing that happens by being there, you give and take. What does that mean? You saw the Democrats voted with Trump. They were gonna vote for it anyway. But they said, okay, we want the debt ceiling. So you know what I mean? There's a give and take. And that's how the legislative process works. You have all these folks, and that's why it took a long effort to get the uh, Obamacare and a whole bunch of other issues that are out there. It doesn't just happen. 
you know, people might vote, but they're going to give and take to be able to get some other things. And you see, from the Democrat side, you know, one of the top things at the top of the list is, is DACA and immigration. They say, okay, you want, you know, this, you want that, you want $15 billion, and there's going to be more billions to get for Texas because of what happened in, in Houston and Rockport. So the good thing is, as long as we have a conversation, there will be a give and take, and hopefully they'll give into DACA. Okay, one more question, please. Okay, so it's like um, over the last couple of years, the Congress has been stalling some of the decisions that has been passed on to them. And I know that President Trump let uh, the Congress decide uh, whether to keep DACA <coughs> or not. Um, so do we really think that in this six months, the Congress will be able to make a decision that if they should stay or not? If I'm just asking because I'm curious. This, I'm sorry, decision to do what? It's like to, uh, because President Trump, President Trump gave the Congress a decision uh, to, like, you know, to keep tr the DACA Act or not. Within six and, months. Yeah, yeah, and it's like because the Congress has been stalling with a lot of their decisions over the last couple of years. So can we really expect them to make a decision in the next six months? In my opinion, yes. And, and I keep on going back to what happened the last week. They could have taken a long time to vote on the 15 billion. Mira, boom. It happened. It happened. And that's with the leadership being against it, Paul Ryan McConnell. Now, how did it happen? We had, and you know, part of the reasons, the other part was we had the 200 Democrats in the House, the 48 Democrats in the Senate said, we're united. We just need a few more Republicans, and they got it done. So, and that's what happens in, in Austin as well. In the Senate is one thing in the House. We have 55 Democrats and 95 Republicans. And us Democrats elect the Speaker of the House. So the answer is yes, it can be done. But this is the key. The key is not that it can be done. The key is, do you want to get it done? The, the law provides, the time provides. We got plenty of time. We just got to get to that one part. We did it for, for uh, uh, hurricane. Within one week, we got it done. And that's what the Republicans voted against it. So that's why I say this last week created you know, uh, an opportunity. And let's talk, for example, about immigration. We have plenty of time. We have plenty of time. But what was everybody? They were each trying to get what they wanted. What, what it was, you know, and you saw what's going on, trying to get the judges, trying to get appointments, trying to, so it, you know, and our, our deal was at the bottom of the list. But the election showed where we we're at the top of the list. Let me tell you what I mean by that. One of the big things is people are trying to figure out is do Hispanics vote, right? And everybody says we don't vote. Well, I disagree. What is the disagreement? We elected a U.S. Senator Hispanic in Nevada. If you look at uh, in, in, uh, in, in Austin, of the 55 state reps, if I was to ask you how many of the, uh, the 55 are, are white, black, and brown, you'd probably say 30 white, you know, 15 black, 10, 10, 10 brown. Well, actually, it's, if 35 of the 55 are Hispanic. So everybody knows that Hispanics vote. So in this discussion, it's also, oh, what are the Hispanics going to do? Well, they're gonna, they were mad in 2016. And they're going to get more mad. But right now, we're not talking about mad. We're talking about getting legislation passed. Well, thank you. have more questions? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you all very much for coming through. Um, now, I, uh, it, it, I also find it incongruous that uh, uh, Trump would end the program uh, uh, to begin with uh, and uh, just uh, why, why not uh, get some legislation passed? Um, my question. Well, sorry, waited too long. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. But no worry. Yeah. We, we can stay here more time if you have more questions. Yeah. Oh, uh, but I would like to I would like to thank uh, all the panelists, uh, Sahara, Saina, okay. Attorney Smith, Vice Consul Edwin. And, Congress, and State Representative Mr. Roberto Alonso, thanks so much for your time. And also to Kelly. Kelly has helped us a lot to set up all this immigration panel and workshop. So thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.